Okay, uh, let's get started uh, with some of the questions of respiratory system, okay? And let's go to our first question. Let's say you have a female who is complaining of fever, cough, and malaise for two days. Her leukocyte count is 22,000 with 8% of band forms. Now, whenever you see that any patient in his CBC has differential count of bands which are high, so what will you think about? If, if you have um, leukocytosis along with bands which are high, so what do you think about uh, when the bands are high? That's usually acute infection. Okay, acute infection means that's bands are nothing but little precursor form of the mature uh, neutrophils. Okay, so whenever there is acute infection, uh, your bone marrow is trying to pump out all the uh, neutrophils which are possible. Okay, and sometimes uh, when you are like bumping the neutrophils in mass, sometimes the neutrophils which are premature are also pumped out. Okay, so they get active uh, even without getting mature so those are called bands so whenever you hear about bands in any question think about that it's that's an acute infection okay so this patient is having leukocytosis with bands so that's probably acute bacterial infection and they are asking that they have if they have given this chest x-ray they are asking like what's the most likely location of pathological process so what do i mean by that they are asking which lobe of the lungs is involved so we are right now focusing on the right lung okay so which lobe of the lung do you think this is involved right upper um, right lower. middle right lower so how, how did you come to that conclusion that it's right upper it's probably uh, there's one horizontal fissure here okay so this horizontal fissure gives you the idea of like what lobe of the lung is involved so this is right upper lobe of the lung because this is horizontal fissure okay now if you look at this one so that's perfectly correct samyukta this is right upper lobe of the lung okay if you look at this the right lung is divided into three parts that's the right upper right middle and the right lower okay and here here you see the horizontal fissure anything which is above horizontal fissure that's probably uh, like involving the right upper lobe of the lung and this is what we wanted to show here if you look at the chest x-ray again this is again the horizontal fissure and this is right upper lobe of the lung okay if they would have given somewhere here it's right middle if they would have given somewhere here it's right right lower and if you look at the left lung it's just two lobes either it's left upper or either it's left lower uh, lobe of the lung okay so this is how they can ask you about um, identifying the lobes of the lung okay let's come to the next one if you see here this is right middle lobe okay this is the horizontal fissure again this is right middle lobe and this is right lower lobe of the lung okay this is right lower lobe this is entirely involving this area and this is this is left lower lobe okay it's not right this is left all right okay next one A man is complaining of a lot of snoring and sh like he is snoring loudly during the sleep and is frequently gasping for the breath. He is having history of hypertension, blood pressure is 150 or 90, BMI is high. On examination, there is bulky tongue and narrow oropharynx. The electrical stimulation of which now will improve the pathophysiological symptoms of this patient. First of all, what's the diagnosis? Obstructive sleep apnea. That's perfect. That's obstructive sleep apnea. And why do why do you think that these patients can have hypertension? Obstructive sleep apnea patients can have hypertension. Because of intermittent hypoxia. Intermittent hypoxia. So sympathetic nervous system can can get activated, and they will give you which kind of hypertension. If you if you activate your sympathetic nervous system during hypoxia, you will get which kind of hypertension? Like systemic hypertension or pulmonary hypertension? systemic that's systemic okay and because of hypoxia you are going to vasoconstrict your pulmonary vasculature so because of hypoxia you're going to vasoconstrict your pulmonary vasculature and as a result of that you can get pulmonary hypertension okay so these patients are entitled to get both pulmonary as well as systemic hypertension okay and therefore like one of the modality if you just want to treat the hypertension in these patients what do you give How would you treat hypertension in obstructive sleep apnea patients? You give one device. Yes, very good. 
that CPAP okay so you give CPAP and that can address the hypertension okay now let's come to this one electrical stimulation of which now can improve the OSA symptoms so what's falling back in OSA Pharynx. Pharynx. Hmm. Tongue. What? Tongue. Tongue. Tongue is falling back. So if you want to stimulate the tongue, um, what will you stimulate? Which nerve you'll sim stimulate? That's twelfth nerve, right? How you stimulate the hypoglossal nerve in obstructive sleep apnea patient and that can prevent falling back of the tongue and can prevent obstructive sleep apnea okay so here is again hypoglossal uh, you stimulate the hypoglossal nerve and can prevent the falling back of the tongue okay obstructive sleep apnea how would you diagnose obstructive sleep apnea in patient diagnosis sleep it's studies night sleep studies and that's also called as polysomnography what were you trying to say meet i just say sleep sleep studies but yes. it is as a different way yes 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 that's perfect uh, that's sleep studies okay next one a man is complaining of shortness of breath okay and he's having cough sharp right-sided chest pain which is getting worse by deep inspiration now whenever you have chest pain which is worsened by deep inspiration that's pleuritic kind of chest pain okay now you have to think about the lung pathology whenever you hear uh, or read this kind of thing that's pleuritic chest pain x-ray is showing consolidation of right lower lobe of the lung and right sided effusion during thoracosynthesis the needle is inserted along the upper border of the 10th rib at the right mid axillary line so here is our 10th rib and at the upper border of 10th rib you are inserting the needle now they are asking if you if you do this what structure you can injure if you just insert the needle at around 10th rib on this side what organ do you have here in right upper quadrant liver liver perfect perfect and what's the area if suppose this is your rib okay where you should insert upper or lower area on the upper border of the rib or the lower border of the rib where you should insert the needle whenever you are doing thoracosynthesis upper border upper border that's very perfect because if you do it in lower border you might injure intercostal nerves and vessels okay so you don't want to do that that's why you like do it in upper um, lobe of the lung now if you if you look at this diagram that there are specific if you just look here that your pleura has different borders if you compare on the anterior side on the axillary side and on the posterior side okay so if you are doing thoracosynthesis from the mid clavicular line okay you should do along you should do along sixth rib okay at the lower border of the sixth rib uh, sorry upper border of the sixth rib okay but you are doing it anyway below sixth rib but at the upper border of any rib that's what i'm trying to say if you are doing at the mid axillary line you should do around eighth rib and on the paravertebral line on the back side you should do along tenth rib tenth rib okay so these are the sites of thoracosynthesis if you just look here uh, look at the chart here that this is the boundary of the pleura if you look at the lower border of the pleura this is your entire lung okay so on the mid clavicular line this is your sixth rib on the mid axillary line this is your eighth rib and on the posterior paravertebral line this is your tenth rib so pleura is actually the lower the uh, what do you call the lower border of the pleura is which is like kind of visceral pleura okay this this one so i would say this is visceral pleura or the lower border of the lung is on the sixth eighth and tenth uh, around the tenth rib and below that if you just add two ribs to all those things okay plus two plus two that's the boundary of the parietal pleura so you have to pierce somewhere in these two between okay in order to like get thoracosynthesis so between sixth and eighth on the mid clavicular line between eighth and tenth on the mid axillary line and between tenth and twelfth on the paravertebral line okay on the back side but always pierce at the upper border of the lip, rib because you can injure your um, intercostal nerves and vessels okay next one 
a man is hospitalized for the left lower lobe pneumonia he is evaluated for fever the imaging studies shows left sided pleural effusion the tube is inserted in the fifth intercostal space and the mid axillary line which muscles can be pierced okay now you have to tell me if you just insert a chest tube on the fifth intercostal space in the mid axillary line what structures do you pierce starting from skin followed by subcutaneous tissue followed by Anterior. Very good. Serratus anterior Serratus followed anterior. by followed by what other intercostal things do you pierce? That's intercostal muscles, right? So apart from serratus anteriors, you also pierce intercostal muscles, and then finally you pierce parietal pleura. And then you can go to the pleural space. So skin, subcutaneous tissue, serratus anterior muscle, and then you insert, uh, and like uh, insert through the intercostal muscles. Okay, intercostal muscles, and then finally the parietal pleura. So these are the um, structures which can be pierced when you insert the chest tubes. Okay, so skin, subcutaneous tissue, serratus anterior, intercostal muscles, followed by parietal pleura, and then then you can reach the pleural cavity, and you can do thoracosynthesis. Okay. So this is your serratus anterior. This is how you can pierce it during the insertion of chest tube. All right. An elderly man is having cerebral infarction and he underwent swallowing studies which showed, which showed oropharyngeal dysp dysphagia. He's, he experienced vomiting while lying on his back and develops pneumonia. That's an aspiration pneumonia. Now they are asking which lobe of the lung can be involved when you aspirate while you are lying down. So what's your answer? Right middle lobe. Right middle lobe. Right upper lobe. Right upper lobe. Which part of the right upper lobe? The upper part. No, the lower part. The lower part of the right upper lobe or the upper oh, part of the right lower lobe, right? Perfect. So, if you look at this one, if you aspirate by lying down, okay, this is what can be involved. That's the right up, that's the right lower part of the upper lobe, that's this one, or the upper part of the lower lobe that's the right upper part of the lower lobe these two can be involved if the patient is aspirating while uh, lying down if the patient is aspirating while staying upright you can always uh, like involve these structures okay if the, if the patient is aspirating on the uh, by like standing you involve like bilateral basilar segments okay that's about aspiration and right right lung is more involved because it's like more kind of straight that's why okay oops a young female is complaining of productive cough her sputum is purulent with pink streaks of blood there is sharp pain on the right shoulder and the neck okay sputum purulent with sharp pain on the right shoulder crackles and dullness on the right lower lobe of the lung listening with the stethoscope at the right mid back shows whenever you ask the patient to say e you can hear a okay now they are asking if the patient is having pain at the right shoulder along with some pneumonia in the lung, which nerve is responsible for the right shoulder pain? Phrenic nerve. Very good. Okay. Very good. Okay. That's phrenic nerve. That's the referred pain because of phrenic nerve. So there are two things which you need to remember. We talked about these pleuras, right? Um, so this is which pleura? This one is cervical pleura, right? This one is costal pleura. This one? Diaphragmatic. Diaphragmatic. And what about this one? Mediastinal. Mediastinal. And diaphragmatic and mediastinal pleura are carried by which nerve? The nerve sensations are carried by which nerve? Phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve. That's perfect. And what about cervical and this one? Costal pleura. They are carried by which nerves? Okay. Intercostal nerve. Very yes. good. Okay. So anybody is having rib fracture or something, okay, and he like injured like these areas. If anybody is in, like having rib fracture and they irritate the 
what we call cervical and the costal pleura it, the pain is carried by the intercostal nerves okay it's very important okay next one so here is like the summary but here is the next version an elderly man is having pleural effusion now there is history of base of the tongue squamous cell carcinoma with involvement of multiple left anterior cervical lymph nodes he underwent surgery of the neck okay in order to remove the tumor and some anterior cervical lymph nodes the x-ray is showing left-sided pleural effusion so what are you thinking what did you injure while doing surgery somewhere in the left neck that after that the patient got pleural effusion on the left side what do you think happened to the patient any idea Plura, what do you think you cervical pleura cervical pleura if you injure the cervical pleura uh, while doing neck dissection what you can get pneumothorax you get pneumothorax right so if you injure the cervical pleura while doing neck dissection you can get pneumothorax but this patient is getting pleural effusion while operating um, like let's say after the operation if you get carotid damage uh i don't think the patient like would be hemodynamically like would be stable hemodynamically and there's um, like so you are asking that you are saying that this patient might have developed hemothorax yes possibly this patient if if they develop hemothorax so if you develop like injure carotid okay there it's like little far in proximate like it's little far like that that it can go to the pleura it can go okay when you injure the carotid it can like everything can go into the uh, pleural cavity but let's say the patient is hemodynamically stable what sir, other vocal structures? cord injury vocal cord how uh, would you no no sir uh, no no laryngeal no how would you get um plural effusion if you just involve the recurrent laryngeal now you might get just hoarseness of the voice right this patient is getting pleural effusion after doing some neck surgery here okay there's one structure which drains all the lymph nodes and which empties thorax. into one chylothorax chylothorax this is chylothorax and you, you you have injured a structure which is which is draining at the junction of jugular and the subclavier vein at the brachiocephalic trunk brachiocephalic vein what's that structure that's thoracic duct right so thoracic duct empties here so this is your thoracic duct which like drains everything from your abdomen and actually empties here this is your um, jugular vein that this is your subclavian vein and this combines to make brachiocephalic right so your thoracic duct can can be injured at the junction of uh, jugular vein and the subclavian vein okay jugular vein and subclavian vein and if you injure that um, you get chylothorax because all the lymph will leak out by the way if you do the thoracosynthesis and you send this thoracosynthesis of the chylothorax um, for the lab examination what do you think will it be exudative pleural effusion will it, will it be transudative pleural effusion exudative very good this will be exudative pleural effusion and there's one specific thing about chylothorax that if you find those specific thing which are very very high in pleural effusion then you can say okay this is just chylothorax can triglyceride. you tell me that very triglyceride. Good. excellent if you find lot of triglycerides in the pleural effusion that's chylothorax okay lot of triglycerides exudative in nature you might have injured some lymph vessels um that's um chylothorax okay perfect okay any patient who is complaining uh, who is having bilateral pleural effusion and he is also um, having bibasilar crackles and he is having history of heart failure okay and on auscultation you hear s3 s3 heart sound as well should you do thoracocentesis in that in that patient patient is having heart failure s3 heart sound bilateral pleural effusion with bibasilar crackles so you are seeing pleural effusions on the both side would you do thoracocentesis from the both side and send it to the lab for analysis no no why 
because it's a transudate it's because of the uh, left heart failure so you can get diuretics very excellent patient um sorry excellent guys this is very very important okay so if you are if you are seeing any patients who is having bilateral pathologies and you are thinking that pathology is somewhere like other than the infectious or all those pathologies you don't need to do thoracocentesis okay you just um, give some diuretics and see those like things are resolving or no so this probably patient is having bilateral prodiffusion by basal clicker because of heart failure don't need to do thoracocentesis but if the patient is having unilateral prodiffusion aspirate and send it to the lab and i didn't try to identify the pathology okay young man is coming to an er coming to the er after a fight at bar respiratory rate is 28 blood pressure is 88 over 60 heart rate is 114 there is right sided stab wound along the upper surface uh, upper surface of the clavicle between the lateral border of the sternum and mid clavicular line which structures do you think can be injured if you just put somebody stab somebody here which structure do you think the patient can injure which structures do you think can be injured if you just hit somebody here right here okay why is the patient hemodynamically unstable after you hit the stab here pneumothorax this is absolutely pneumothorax okay because the cervical pleura can extend above the clavicle as well so whenever you injure, you can injure the pleura and you can get pneumothorax. And what kind of pneumothorax do you can expect if somebody is having knife like injury here? Do you think that pneumothorax will be tension pneumothorax or simple pneumothorax? Tension pneumothorax. It's just tension pneumothorax. Okay, so if you have stab wound here, you might get tension pneumothorax. Next step in management. Needle decompression. Biopsy. Mm. Ah. Why would you do biopsy? Where will you do biopsy, Yashasvi? Sorry, sorry. No, no. Uh, mm -hmm. What? Thoracostomy. Needle decompression is the first step in management, okay? Uh, answered by me. That's the first step in management. Then you do like whatever things you want to do, okay? Then you can like at later point, you can insert the chest tube. For any tension pneumothorax, your first step in management is always needle decompression, followed by chest tube placement. If you say that patient is having simple pneumothorax, then you don't need to do needle like decompression. Then you might just directly insert the chest tube. But if patient is having tension pneumothorax, first is needle compression, pull out the air, and then you put the chest tube. Okay, lung biopsy where never okay lung biopsy when would you choose lung biopsy if somebody is having let's say we are suspecting some mass and if it's in the central then you might do biopsy like by bronchoscopy in the central if somebody is having peripheral lung mass then you might do video assisted the thoracoscopic biopsy in the peripheral mass okay that's the step two question that if somebody is having any lung mass which is in the center you do the bronchoscopic guided biopsy central okay in the center but if somebody is having mass in the peripheral side you, you cannot like, insert the bronchus and pull it on the periphery side right so if you have peripheral mass you do vats that's video assisted thoracoscopic surgery and then you do the biopsy here so that's for if you have any mass in the lung so that was pneumothorax the previous one okay this one if you see the collapsed lung and if you have tension pneumothorax, the mediastinum will shift to which side? Opposite side. Okay. Opposite. And if you have simple pneumothorax, the mediastinum will shift to? Same side. side. Very good. Okay. This is very, very important. That's how you can judge the management of uh, the pneumothorax. Okay. Now let's come to our favorite part. This is your oxygen, uh, oxygen dissociation curve. And now they are asking that uh, some scientist is doing some investigations and experimentation, all those things. And now, now they are saying that if you want to do some transition from point one, from point one to point two, okay, hemoglobin molecules are most likely to release what? If you want to transition from one to number two, hemoglobin molecules are most likely to release what? Okay, first of all, tell me 
Point number two is acting at lungs or at tissue levels. It is acting at lungs. That's very perfect. So point number two is at lungs. Point number one is at which level? Tissues. Point number uh, so perfect. Point number one is at the tissue level. Point number two is is at the lungs level. Now at the lungs level, you know that you want to do oxygenation of your hemoglobin. Okay so oxygen will come okay it will bind with the hemoglobin oxygen will come and it will bind with the hemoglobin and you will form oxyhemoglobin here this is just doing a lot of lag today so you form oxyhemoglobin at point number two at the lung side and here you form deoxyhemoglobin uh, at the tissue level now they are asking if you move from point number one to point number two initially something was attached to the hemoglobin but if you want to attach oxygen to that hemoglobin you need to release that molecule what's that molecule chloride chloride okay when you talk about chloride shift whenever you are at the levels of whenever you are at the level of tissue okay and you want to transport bicarb to the lungs what do you think the chloride should enter the rbc or should leave Sorry. the rbc yes enter the rbc chloride should enter the rbc here okay so here it is chloride entering the rbc so at the tissue level the chloride enters the rbc the bicarbs leaves the rbc and bicarbs just goes to the lungs and then it again enters enters the rbc at the lungs level and this is how it just mix up the h2 and co2 and co2 is puffed up in the lungs okay so chloride is entered in the tissue level and chloride is exited at the lungs level so they are asking if you transition from point one to two what is released outside one thing is very sure but the chloride if you just chloride is entered at the tissue level it is like exited at the lungs level but they are asking what is released from the hemoglobin molecule not from the rbc now for that you have to tell me if you want to irritate your hemoglobin molecule that okay something binds and hemoglobin is irritated and releases oxygen how can you irritate just like monkey how can you irritate your like hemoglobin two three bpg okay that's that's an important um, the point that if you attach two three bpg to that hemoglobin molecule can cross link and release the oxygen other thing is proton if you attach proton to the hemoglobin okay you just release the oxygen okay perfect now now you tell me again if you want to go from one number to two number you at two number you want to attach the oxygen you should release the proton right you should release the proton then only then the oxygen can come and bind here it is at point number two is oxyhemoglobin at point number one is reduced hemoglobin so i can write like this here the hemoglobin form is h hb here the hemoglobin form is hemoglobin oxygenated okay that's oxygenated hemoglobin so if you are not still understanding let me show you the shifts here is it okay where is vishwa vishwa is here i am here but i am uh, here only Thank yeah you this slides have you kept it this uh, uh, have you kept uh, this open in your uh, is is your mac getting hot uh that's fine okay mac is getting hot i know but that's okay uh what i was saying that if you look at this graph this is at the alveoli level okay as the oxygen enters as the oxygen enter it it wants to bind with the hemoglobin and hence you form oxyhemoglobin but if you do that you have to release proton okay that's what this question is trying to ask at the alveoli the oxygen should come should bind with your oxyhemoglobin and you should release proton then and only then proton will bind with bicarb and you form h2co3 and release co2 and h2o and you just puff up carbon dioxide in the alveoli okay whereas in tissues tissues where hemoglobin should bind with the proton okay at the tissue it is called as pores effect at the alveoli it's called as Haldane's effect okay perfect now let's come to the next one 
sample of normal respiratory mucosa student is asked to identify cell types present after staining with h and e stain okay uh, he observes that the respiratory epithelium changes in composition as the airway continues to like airway continues distally from trachea to the alveoli duct um, now they are asking which feature is last to disappear but it's just like difficult to just let's just like this but you tell me if i take biopsy from trachea and bronchi what kind of epithelial will i find you have to tell me the entire name of that epithelium pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium very good pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium if i just go below below to the bronchi uh, what epithelium will i identify simple ciliated columnar yes that simple ciliated columnar epithelium if i just go to the terminal bronchioles what do i identify same one oh, no it becomes cuboidal it becomes cuboidal okay so bronchi is ciliated pseudo stratified columnar in proximal bronchial it's ciliated columnar at terminal bronchial it's ciliated cuboidal okay it's ciliated it's, it's like still ciliated now if you go to the respiratory bronchioles then it becomes non ciliated cuboidal so they are asking as you move from above to downward which is the thing which is dis disappearing at last and then your answer is cilia because cilia is staying there from bronchi proximal bronchi and terminal bronchial okay so this is staying there from bronchi proximal bronchial and terminal bronchial another question if some foreign body enters and it lodges in the proximal bronchial what thing will remove that foreign body mucociliary uh, clearance mechanism because it when it lodges the proximal bronchial it with it will be trapped in the cilia and to be sent up what if the foreign body is lodging in the respiratory bronchial how it will be cleared alveolar macrophage alveolar macrophage perfect during experiments lung alveoli exposed to nitrogen dioxide okay as a result of that there is necrosis of your entire alveoli okay histological examination of the injured tissue a, a month later shows partial recovery of alveolar epithelial lining they are asking which cells are responsible for regenerating everything type 1 pneumocytes or type 2 pneumocytes type 1 pneumocytes Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry, type two pneumocytes. Type two. Type two pneumocytes. Type two pneumocytes are the stem cells. Okay, alveolar type two pneumocytes are the stem cells. They form type two pneumocytes also and type one pneumocytes also. Okay, so type two pneumocytes are uh, responsible for formation of type one and type two cells both. And type two pneumocytes are columnar. Okay, they are columnar. And what's the other function of type two pneumocytes? apart Surfactant from stem cells production. surfactant production surfactants are produced from which bodies lamellar lamellar bodies very good okay a man is exercising okay and they are asking about exercise physiology okay let's say he is just exercising now you just tell me what will happen to the hemoglobin affinity for oxygen whenever you exercise what will happen to the hemoglobin affinity for the oxygen decrease what decrease decrease how many of you say increases the hemoglobin affinity decreases right because of what your body need a more oxygen that's why body needs more oxygen the so body muscles will produce more acid right yes so more yes. protons so shift to right uh, more temperature so shift to right so mm, more two three bpg shift to right okay so all those exercises will shift to right and whenever there is shift to right the affinity for the oxygen decreases okay so hemoglobin affinity for the oxygen decreases because of shift to right when you exercise what will happen to the ph of your arterial blood decreases decreases because of Hmm. Did you say increase meat? No, no, no. I say decrease. Okay, decrease because of lactic acidosis, right? What happens to physiological dead space when you exercise? This is important. Decrease. 
excellent the physiological dead space decreases because of the phenomena of recruitment okay more and more pulmonary capillaries will be recruited they'll open up so more blood flow will come up okay and what will happen to the vq ratios at the top whenever you exercise it will increase or decrease increase vq ratio will increase no sorry vq hmm so now why Actually more oxygen come from more oxygen exchange over there what is the normal vq ratio at the top so ventilation is less at the top but perfusion is very very less at the top okay so vq ratio is more than one at the top is that correct yes this is the normal uh, vq ratio at the top of the lung now if when you exercise the perfusion will increase but the ventilation will also increase okay so vq ratio will come closer um to the one okay come we'll try to come closer to the one but it will actually increase because of lot of ventilation when you exercise no doubt the like pulmonary flow will be also increased but the vq ratio the vq mismatch will go away and it will try to match the ventilation and perfusion both okay so if you just talk about in grossly in terms of vq ratio it will actually increase because of lot of ventilation okay as you exercise um the physiological dead space will decrease the same the same phenomena is because of recruitment more blood vessels will be opened up okay and that's why what will happen to the pulmonary vascular resistance when you exercise decreased pulmonary vascular resistance will decrease okay when you exercise what will happen to the systemic vascular resistance when you exercise decrease systemic vascular resistance will also decrease because of beta to receptor and skeletal muscles vasodilation what will happen to um, mixed venous oxygen concentration mvo2 that is also decrease very good meet excellent the mixed venous oxygen concentration decrease when you exercise because your tissues are trying to extract more oxygen okay what will happen to mbo2 in septic shock increased increased excellent that's the only place where mbo2 is increased mixed venous oxygen because in septic shock there is hyperdynamic circulation okay you will get no chance to extract oxygen tissues get no chance to extract oxygen so the venous content of oxygen will be very high because tissues are not able to extract the oxygen okay so mvo2 will be high in septic shock wherever whereas like in any other cause wherever where like hemorrhagic shock or anything okay the mvo2 will be low okay even when you exercise mvo2 will be low because tissues will extract a lot of oxygen what will be the venous blood co2 content when you exercise increase increase perfect uh o2 content of venous o2 content decrease decreased perfect all right so this is what we talked about let's come to this one a man is hit by a car and he is now having comminuted comminuted fracture of pelvis and the lower limb uh, volume resuscitation is done they have given rbc plasma everything after several hours he develops dyspnea and hypoxia so initially he was having hemorrhagic shock you give a lot of fluids rbc and plasma now he is complaining of dyspnea and hypoxia chest chest imaging is showing new bilateral infiltrates that's white out of the lung endotracheal intubation is done despite of aggressive resuscitation he is he like he's dead in 24 hours what's your diagnosis what's your diagnosis ARDS this is ARDS very good this is ARDS and uh, adult respiratory distress syndrome what do you think will be the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure in this patient normal 
it uh, it will be normal what did you say myth increased or decreased decrease decrease, decrease. okay yes. okay yes it can decrease or either is normal okay it, it's not increased okay now they are asking the pathophysiology of ARDS so pathophysiology of the ARDS either you like hit all your um, type 1 pneumocytes that's the squamous epithelium you damage entire thing okay and you damage those endothelial cell and there is like leaking of the, the vascular like um, of the fluid um, and hence like you get edema everywhere so they are asking what's the pathophysiology your answer is you hit all the squamous cell there is endothelial cell damage and there is increased permeability of the endothelial cells okay so what do you damage type 1 pneumocytes which are also squamous cells in acute respiratory distress syndrome that's why it's also called as highline membrane disease because you damage those um, squamous epithelium and a lot of high a lot of protein exudate will come out and that protein will lay down a highline membrane that's why it's also called as highline membrane disease okay now uh, let's say a uh, woman who is residing in florida but now goes to the altitude of let's say 11900 feet okay now they are asking what will change this is actually an interesting question okay i i i, I had to think a lot about this one now they they have asked like as you go to the altitude what will happen to your cardiac output plasma volume and pulmonary arterial resistance let's break this down what will happen to plasma volume as you go to the altitude and why first of all tell me as you go to the altitude what will happen to your blood ph decrease increases increased it is increased right did you say all increased the blood ph will increase because of respiratory alkalosis respiratory alkalosis as it goes to the goes to the altitude the atmospheric barrier pressure drops okay and you feel hypoxia you increase your respiratory rate you puff up the carbon dioxide and you get respiratory alkalosis and your blood, blood ph levels will increase so because of respiratory alkalosis your blood ph increases what will be the renal excretion of bicarb b renal excretion of bicarb increase Increase. renal excretion of bicarb increase because you get a lot of already having a lot of alkalosis so you want to increase or dump out more bicarb okay so renal excretion of bicarb is increasing but and what increases so when you're having respiratory alkalosis you are puffing out carbon dioxide right meat so when you puff out carbon dioxide what, what? is carbon dioxide acid or base oh, no. Uh, no 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 but there is a hypoxia right at the uh -huh. altitude uh -huh. So hypoxia, hypoxia retain the carbon dioxide. So it should be the acidosis. Why do you think hypoxia will retain carbon dioxide? I mean, in altitudes, at altitudes, at, at, at altitude, when you are having hypoxia, uh, okay, so you are, okay, I understand what are you saying. Whenever you are having high altitude, your, your, atmospheric barrel pressure is decreased as a result of that whatever air is coming to your pao2 is decreased is that correct myth yes because at atmosphere at like altitude your pio2 is less and if you look at the formula of pio2 that's the atmospheric air that depends on the oxygen concentration that's 21 percent multiplied by the surface like the surface pressure 760 minus the water vapor pressure and there the atmospheric pressure is decreased from 760 that's why your pio2 is decreased and because your pio2 is decreased because of low barometric pressure in the altitude your pao2 decrease that's the alveolar pressure decrease and as a result of that what will happen to your pao2 small small a at altitude decrease increase oh my god why if your pao2 decreases what will happen to pao2 like p capital a decreases what will happen to p small a o2 also decrease it decrease. should also decrease okay there is no chance that p small p a o2 will increase like if you have less oxygen you will have less dissolved oxygen in your blood also 
so your p small a o2 will also decrease now you are having hypoxia okay now because of this you are having hypoxia also hypoxia causes the lactic acidosis right no that is you are you are very correct so lactic if if it's just lactic acidosis and provided that you have enough oxygen okay then we might have gone to your pathway but here the barometric pressure is low from the top okay so barometric pressure is low you are getting less alveolar oxygen less arterial oxygen because of that you are having hypoxia now why do you think the patient is increasing the respiratory rate at altitudes try to compensate the low oxygen level yes that's the reason okay when you whenever you get hypoxia it's going to stimulate your respiratory center okay to to get like more oxygen that's why you increase your respiratory rate but in not like in doing that you just puff up your carbon dioxide and uh, you lose your carbon dioxide and your ph increases now what's exactly your doubt meet where are you getting confused no i thought uh, is is there hypoxia so lactic acidosis also there so i thought the ph increases sorry ph decreases you can decrease your ph if there is lactic acidosis because of hypoxia no doubt about it okay and there may there may be a possibility that ph might decrease because of lactic acidosis at altitude okay but the predominant component here might be the respiration okay so and lactic acidosis is metabolic acidosis right lactic acidosis is metabolic acidosis and here we are respiration compensation is just quick i mean the change uh, which the body can do as, as far as the respiratory system is concerned is very quick so whenever you get hypoxia you just immediately improve your increase your respiratory rate and you have respiratory alkalosis definitely you can have lactic acidosis at high altitude okay and that might bring down a ph little bit but predominant component of uh, respirate like altitude sickness is always uh, respiratory alkalosis okay meet okay got it all right now now you know that there is a, there is respiratory alkalosis there the blood ph is high and you want to excrete bicarb would you want to excrete proton into the urine when you are having um, alkalosis in the in the blood no no if you excrete proton into the urine you are just going to perpetuate your met like alkalosis okay so what do you think should you have high levels of aldosterone or low levels of aldosterone in your body if you have high levels of aldosterone that's going to retain salt and water and it's going to pump out what potassium and proton right that's what the aldosterone does it absorbs salt and water and it's going to pump out proton and potassium that's the normal function of aldosterone now do you think this patient should have high levels of aldosterone do you want to pump out proton Yes or no? No. No, you shouldn't have high levels of aldosterone. If you have high levels of aldosterone, this patient will no doubt retain salt and water, but it will lose proton and this will in like perpetuate more alkalosis. We don't want that. So your body should try to decrease the aldosterone levels. Okay, if you decrease the aldosterone levels, what will happen to your plasma volume? decrease very good okay if you decrease the aldosterone levels your plasma volume decreases because that's a diuretic effect right if you decrease the aldosterone level you just lose salt and water your plasma volume may decrease so your first answer here is at altitude your plasma volume decreases what will happen to the pulmonary arterial resistance as you go to the altitude At, at the altitude you get hypoxia so as a result of that hypoxia what will happen to the pulmonary increased increased okay so because of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction your pulmonary arterial resistance will increase 
Okay, oh my god. What will happen to cardiac output? Increase. Why? Increase sympathetic activity. At, at high altitude, you will have increased sympathetic activity because of? Because of hypoxia, hmm. right? Yes, decrease O2. Yes, so because of hypoxia, you increase your cardiac output. I found this question very, very interesting. So I would keep this in mind, okay? This is a good question. So it's like linking aldosterone and altitude was very important here. And we came to that conclusion by, okay, at you, as you go to the altitude, you get respiratory alkalosis, the pH of the blood is high, and you don't want to dump more proton and like perpetuate more alkalosis. So as you go to the altitude, your aldosterone level should actually drop and your plasma volume will drop and you want to excrete less proton into the urine so that it will remain in the blood and help uh, buffer the alkalosis. Okay, at the altitude, what will sh what will happen to the hemoglobin dissociation curve? Shift to right. Perfect. Shift, right. Shift to right. By the way, these notes are made by Vishwa Patel. So this is um, altitude. These are the changes in the lungs. Okay, as you go to the altitude because of hypoxia, high increase in uh, peri like pulmonary vascular resistance. So pulmonary vascular resistance will be high. Pulmonary artery pressure will be high. Your minute ventilation will be high. You puff out carbon dioxide, so your PaO2 will be low. Because of hypoxia, it will stimulate the peritubular uh, cells of your peritubular capillaries, pericytes of your peritubular capillaries, and as, as a result of that, your erythropoietin will be high. Okay, amount of bicarb excretion in the kidneys will be high, but there will be aldosterone suppression. As a result of that, your your plasma volume will be low, and you will retain proton okay your 2 3 bpg will be high that will shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the right okay and hemoglobin concentration is high because of high erythropoietin and your heart rate is increased because of hypoxia as a result of that you slightly increase the cardiac output and why do you think the patient will have vasodilation this is counterintuitive why do you think the patient can have vasodilation at high altitude Why do you think so? We expect that whenever CO2 is increased due to vasodilation and there is more blood flow. Whenever CO2 is decreased due to vasoconstriction, there is less blood flow. And at the altitude, you already know that you are washing out your carbon dioxide. There should be vasoconstriction. So why there is vasodilation here? We talked about this yesterday. What other thing determines the cerebral blood flow apart from carbon dioxide? If it is decreased so much, you will increase your cerebral blood flow. And that thing is? Oxygen. Oxygen. Very good. So we looked at that graph, right? Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to draw this. It's a lot of lag. So we looked at that graph that usually this you can only increase the cerebral blood flow when the oxygen level is too less okay and you can increase the cerebral blood flow just by increasing little bit carbon dioxide so these were two graphs of the as you increase the carbon dioxide concentration you increase the cerebral blood flow or you have to decrease a lot of pao2 in order to increase the cerebral blood flow and here the here is the thing because of vasodilation is because of hypoxia okay you decrease a lot of PaO2 as a result of that you get hypoxia and as a result of that you get like increased cerebral blood flow that's why if somebody is having altered mental status and uh, gait disturbance at altitude that's a medical emergency you have to think about cerebral edema and send them down okay that's very very important because otherwise that otherwise you can get brain herniation okay a young man is coming to ED, he is unresponsive, history of IV drug abuse, temperature is this, blood pressure is this, pulse is this, respiratory rate is 8. Young man, unresponsive, hypoventilation, is unconscious with pinpoint pupils. What are you thinking here? Opioid intoxication. Opioid intoxication, perfect. Endotracheal intubation is done, he is mechanically ventilated and he is minute volume is 6 liter but alveolar ventilation is 4.2 liters where the rest of the ventilation is getting wasted
six and four point two minute ventilation dead is six, space. but dead, dead space. space. Excellent. That's physiological dead space. Uh, so minute one ventilation is six liter, but uh, like the actual exchange is four point two. So rest of the volume is getting actually um, in the dead space, and dead, dead space can be anatomical as well as phys like uh, alveolar dead space. Both and you combine both them, uh, you get physiological dead space. Okay, elderly man is coming. Um, you obtain ABG uh, of that patient, and you like do that serially. So compared to thirty years ago. What will be the most cons like consistent finding of this elderly men in regards to uh, PaO2, PaCO2 and alveolar arterial gradient? So they are asking as you age, this is an aging question, as you age, what will happen to PaO2, PaCO2 and alveolar arterial gradient? What's your answer? PaO2 decrease, uh -huh. PaCO2 increase and Pa gradient increase very good so aa gradient increase because um, there is one one thing which you are like as you age there can be like micro collapse or micro atelectasis of your alveoli so everything will be collapsed as you age that's because like you lose your elastic tissue and as you lose your elastic tissue as you age what will happen to the lung compliance as you lose your increase perfect uh, your lung compliance is increasing as you age and at the top there will be connective tissue weakness so as a result of that you get microatelectasis as you age and because of that microatelectasis um, less oxygen will come to the alveoli less oxygen will go to the arteries so a a gradient will increase alveolar oxygen arterial gradient will increase okay because like because of microatelectasis so this is a very good flow chart uh, of of the aging that because of AA gradient, uh, high AA gradient and microatelectasis, you have less PaO2. Now, when you come to PaCO2, why do you think um, PaCO2 will remain normal? Meat. Because CO2 is the most lipid soluble substance no matter you mess up with the barrier okay a lot of you even you put a lot of fibrosis in the alveolar septa in when in interstitial lung disease co2 is very very lipid soluble so no matter you mess up with your interstitium co2 co2 can just go away okay so you said co2 would increase because you thought like if you have a lot of fibrosis co2 will have a hard time coming out right myth yes Yes, because yes. of microatelectasis but the reason is co2 is very very lipid soluble even if there is a lot of barrier it can just go away okay that's why co2 will remain kind of unchanged but i would accept slightly increase in co2 as well so both of them would be correct okay so as you age um, the elastic tissue goes down and because of that what will happen to the residual volume as you age increases increases okay elastic tissue decreases as a result of that the residual volume will increase because the lung will expand it will not recoil back so residual volume increases what will happen to the total lung capacity increases total lung capacity will remain unchanged okay because like that's your maximum uh, thing as you age total lung capacity will uh, remain unchanged but your residual volume will increase so if your residual volume increase and total lung capacity remaining same, what will happen to the vital capacity? Decrease. 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 Very good. So residual volume increases. Okay. It's a lot of air trapping, but vital capacity decreases. Okay. And total cap total lung capacity remains unchanged. And because of microatelectasis, your AA gradient is high. And because of that, you can have less PaO2. All right, what will happen to the chest wall compliance as you age? Will it be more flexible or will it get more stiff? Decrease. 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 It will get more stiff. Wonderful. Okay, next question. Uh, they have shown lung compliance, chest wall compliance and combined compliance. Okay, so this is lung compliance. This is chest wall compliance and this is combined compliance. 
why is this acting like this because um because of this chest wall has a tendency of going out lungs has capacity of going in that's why these two has different rub but when you combine they behave like this okay now they are asking at the end of maximal inspiration the intrapleural pressure is minus eight centimeter now they are asking at rest that means at functional residual capacity frc is the place uh, you know where everything is like zero okay atmospheric pressure and the all the pressure is zero like at lung is at the rest at that point they are asking like here at this black dot what will be the estimated intrapleural pressure so when i say that at functional residual capacity everything is normal the pressures are okay pressures are zero pressures are normal are the pressures really zero or there is some pressure inside the lung let's say i'm saying alveolar pressure becomes zero at functional residual capacity is it like zero no so why do they call zero pressure um, it's in comparison with the pressure in the lung uh-huh what comparison what are you like comparing with actually we take zero at the sea level but actually 760 mm of hg pressure is there even we call it zero otherwise if you tell zero pressure the lung will, coll lung will collapse okay so even if i say pressure is zero that means i am trying to say the pressure is 760 mm hg and when i say pressure is minus phi i am actually saying 760 minus phi that's 755 okay now now at the alveoli if the pressure is zero and in the intrapleural pressure is um, minus five so i'm actually saying 760 and 755 so here pressure is less that's why we call it that the intrapleural pressure is more negative so even at the rest no doubt your alveolar pressure is zero okay because it's just going to um, equilibrate with the environment it's a lot of lag today so this is your alveoli okay it's going to equilibrate with the environment no doubt the, your alveolar pressure will become zero okay your alveolar pressure will become zero but the intrapleural pressure even at the rest will remain minus five so if you look at this black dot here okay this black dot is not exactly falling at the level of zero it's just a little bit on the left side so at the rest the intrapleural pressure is still minus five centimeter of water that's your question okay oh my god okay next one elderly women is having history of osteoporosis and moderate kyphosis because of casual loss of vertebral height she never smoked compared to her physiology testing done years ago what changes are most consistent with normal aging so again this is a normal aging question um, they are asking what will happen to the lung compliance quickly lung compliance as you age increase increase very good okay lung compliance increases what will happen to the uh chest wall compliance decrease physiologic dead space as you age increase increase perfect so and if you look at the total respiratory compliance because chest wall is getting stiffed total respiratory compliance will decrease okay all right this so again aging a woman is coming to ED after being stuck in a malfunctioning elevator and for 45 minutes. She is just anxious and she has experienced dizziness, shortness of breath, generalized weakness, blood vision, and she is now having like this. What is causing these symptoms? Stuck in an elevator, you are getting anxious, shortness of breath, and after like, after that, you, you develop like this. What's happening? Respiratory alkalosis. Okay, respiratory alkalosis because of that. What's happening? Washing out of carbon dioxide. Uh huh. Why is this patient having like this? Throws you sign. Okay. Yes, so what's the pathophysiology? What will happen to the ionized calcium levels because of hyperventilation and why?
whenever you hyperventilate your co2 drops that means your ph is increasing in the blood so albumin will albumin will donate the proton okay when the albumin will donate the proton it will create some positive sites because proton is like uh, sorry when albumin will donate the protons it will create some negative sites proton is positive because albumin is like kind of negative so to that negative sites calcium will come and bind okay so your ionized calcium drops and because of your dropping of ionized calcium you get symptoms of hypocalcemia trosseus and schwastik sign okay so whenever you hyperventilate you can get hypocalcemia why do you get hypocalcemia again when you hyperventilate what your albumin will do albumin will donate what proton. when you hyperventilate proton and it will create what sites in the albumin negative sites mm -hmm. right and there the calcium will come and bind so you get a uh, relative hypocalcemia as you hyperventilate okay and why is this patient having uh, shortness of breath generalized weakness and blurring of vision what is happening to this lady because of respiratory alkalosis panic when you attack. wash out huh panic attack panic attack you can get panic attack um, this this lady has got panic attack so why is she having blurred vision and shortness of breath and all those things cerebral vasoconstriction excellent because of whenever you wash out co2 there will be vasoconstriction less cerebral blood flow and you can get dizziness and all those things okay panic attack this is hypocapnia and you reduce your cerebral blood flow very good okay famous question this is venous blood okay it goes to the artery it, uh, saturates uh, the po2 becomes 104 after coming to the heart it again drops to 100 what is dropping the saturation bronchial vein blood yes what blood Okay. bronchial vein bronchial vein blood okay very good because the bronchial vein is normal anatomical shunt um it actually it actually should go to the left uh sorry right heart but it's actually emptying in the in the left heart that's why you drop some of the saturation because of bronchial vein as well as thabasian veins of the heart okay bronchial vein and thabasian veins is dropping the saturation okay because that's called as anatomical shunting so this is happening because of mixing of deoxygenated blood okay man is having cough and progressive shortness of breath he's exposed to large coal dust for 15 years chest x-ray is showing small nodular opacities in the upper lobe of the lung what do you think is happening to this patient pneumoconiosis mm, that's a broad term this is just what sarcoidosis sarcoidosis upper lobe of the lung uh, this is occupational lung disease right you are all the question has already said uh, this is coal workers uh, lung you are already said in sarcoidosis you would expect mediastinal opacity samyukta okay or uh, did you say samyukta or was it rubica no it was me it was me okay uh, so in sarcoidosis uh, you get mediastinal uh, hilar lymphadenopathy here the if the patient is having something in the apex that is something related to coal workers disease okay anyways uh, so this is coal workers disease uh, the lung biopsy is showing fine carbon particles and what would you expect the biopsy finding in sarcoidosis the biopsy finding in sarcoidosis hilar lymphadenopathy Hyalur lymphadenopathy and what kind of hypersensitivity? Non-casating granuloma. Non-casating granuloma type 4 hypersensitivity in sarcoidosis. Okay. Um, drug of choice? Treatment of sarcoidosis? Steroids. Very good. Excellent. Okay. Now they are saying that the coal, this coal workers is what mechanism is most directly responsible for clearing foreign particles from this patient's respiratory tract. So they are saying you inhale, inhale coal. What is responsible for clearing that coal? Macrophage. Macrophage. Phagocytosis. Very good. 
i was waiting for this mucociliary clearing uh, clearing mechanism the reason is coal particles are very very small um joey uh, you, this answer was by joey right if i'm not messing up yes sir okay so mucociliary mechanism is for large particles and coal are very very tiny particles like less than three microns or so so they just go directly to the alveoli and when they go to the alveoli they are phagocytos if i say any large particles are just getting stuck in the respiratory tract it's by mucociliary clearance but if i say coal particles is they are very very small they just go to the alveoli so they are cleared by phagocytosis okay all right so that's coal workers disease this one six year old boy inhales many many small particles becomes lost in terminal bronchioles which respiratory component is most important in clearing these particles now what will you answer mucociliary that is mucociliary clearance okay so they will be cleared by ciliated cells so because in terminal bronchioles we still have cilia anything below terminal bronchioles they will be cleared by macrophage so anything stuck in respiratory bronchiole and alveoli they will be cleared by macrophage very good what happens to the airway resistance as we go from top to respiratory bronchioles increase decrease 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 very good because decrease. of increased what increases as you go from top to bottom surface area very good total surface area increases as you go to the top to the bottom so that the uh, total peripheral resistance decreases as you go from top to bottom very good okay a professional athlete is coming to you she runs on a treadmill and uh, on incremental speed they are just talking about exercise physiology what will happen as compared to the rest what will happen to the minute ventilation vp ratio and mvo2 content now tell me what will happen to minute ventilation as you exercise increase increase in increase what will happen to ventilation perfusion ratio increase increase mvo2 decrease decrease very good mvo2 decrease vp ratio increase minute ventilation increase everybody is clear with this right no doubts okay so the reason why vp ratio is increased because of less like because of reduced physiological dead space okay a researcher is studying hemoglobin uh, they just uh, sent rbc for the centrifugation now the analysis is showing less concentration of chloride uh, in some venous sample as compared to the arterial sample which enzyme is responsible for this uh, for this finding that you have less chloride in the venous side and more chloride on the arterial side which is the main enzyme responsible for carbonic anhydrase which carbonic anhydrase this is carbonic anhydrase very good uh why do you think carbonic anhydrase uh, because so the chloride came out of the cell so hco3 minus came in the cells and they make the air to co3 and remove the co2 so for extend that you need that enzyme so that will yes. come out and that co3 came in right so what what meat is trying to say is when you are at the tissue okay uh, you want to send out the bicarb because you want to transport majority of your carbon dioxide in form of bicarb so at the tissue you are you want to send out that bicarb and you want to bring in chloride and you can only send out that bicarb if you just split a carbonic acid into proton and bicarb okay so in order to do that you need carbonic anhydrase so you split carbon carbonic acid into bicarb and proton with the carbonic anhydrase and you send out the bicarb and you bring chloride inside this is called as chloride shift and what is this bohr's effect or hilden's effect chloride coming uh -huh. chloride coming in and bicarb going out is it pores or head lens okay okay sorry pores effect pores effect perfect so that's because of carbonic anhydrase wonderful okay this is also the question which i like um you can skip every part but okay 
just focus on this the alveolar po alveolar po po2 that's the pao2 in the alveoli is 105 105 and the pulmonary venous pa pao2 is 68 why is this happening my god that alveolar is 105 but still you are not able to oxygenate enough that the uh, you know venous uh, oxygen is less why do you think this is happening due to barrier due to barrier okay because of some interstitial lung disease or some fibrosis this is not um, oxygenating enough okay that's why this is happening all right so because of diffusion impairment some fibrosis happening in between uh, you are not able to exchange that enough okay uh, elderly men is having upper respiratory tract infection He's having history of hypertension, all those things. Uh, his, we have to like compare PFT to the midlife. So as you age, what will happen to your total lung capacity? I mean, same. Okay, focused vital capacity? Decrease. Decreased. Very good. Residual volume? Increased. Increased. Perfect. Very good. So you already know this. A woman is complaining of shortness of breath because of, and when you when you examine the diaphragmatic excursion on both sides are decreased bilaterally. So diaphragmatic excursion are decreased. That means diaphragm is moving less. Okay. On examination, there are fine inspiratory crackles on both sides. Um, you are comparing ABG at the rest versus ABG at vigorous walk. Okay. PaO2 is normal at rest, but it drops significantly when you exercise of this women. Okay, so what exercise related changes are most likely contributing to, to this patient's observation? This is very tough to guess, but they are asking that when the patient is at rest, the PaO2 is normal, but patient exercises, the PaO2 significantly drops. And uh, that women is having less diaphragmatic excursion. Why do you think this is happening? Any idea? Myasthenia cravis. Hmm. Emphysema. Okay. Okay, you have answer in front of you. Make your own hypothesis that PaO2 is normal at rest, but PaO2 is decreasing significantly as you that as this woman is exercising. Why is this happening? And uh, this is little bit. I think you have to think about. Uh, perfusion limited gases and diffusion limited gases and you have to compare when the oxygen is perfusion limited and when the oxygen becomes diffusion limited okay normally oxygen is perfusion limited or diffusion limited normally okay normally perfusion normally oxygen is perfusion limited that means what do you mean by perfusion limited that oxygen can rapidly go from alveoli to the arteries as far as um, the perfusion is okay so if you bring bring like more perfusion more oxygen can come okay so at normally the oxygen is perfusion limited it does not need time whether the blood flow is fast or whether the blood flow is slow oxygen will come down that's called as perfusion limited but in certain pathologies like for example interstitial lung disease oxygen becomes diffusion limited that means if there is any condition which is increasing the pulmonary blood flow oxygen will not come rapidly 
okay you need the blood flow nice and slow because it's diffusion limited in order to get the things oxygenated properly that's why this patient has normal oxygen saturation at rest when she exercised there was hyperdynamic circulation and there was like blood flow was going very very fast so oxygen didn't get enough time to diffuse that's why it becomes diffusion limited when you exercise so in interstitial lung disease your pao2 can be normal when you are when you are at rest but pao2 can decrease significantly when you exercise because in interstitial lung disease oxygen becomes diffusion limited normally it is perfusion limited is everybody with me on this is it okay yes. everyone this is very important concept okay everybody okay yes okay yes sir all right okay that's it about our review